is composite. 10 has more than one set of factors. You could multiply 10 times 1 to get 10, or you can multiply 5 times 2 to get 10. So we've kind of got to, you, you've either got to do a little bit of guessing check work, or uh, you're going to use the slip slide and divide method. So since our middle term is 11, and our last term is 6, I really don't think that it's going to be 10 and 1. Okay, I really don't think it's going to be 10 and 1. So I'm going to start by trying 5 and 2. Okay, I'm going to start by trying 5 and 2. And let's see here. Mm, 3 and 2. If we do 2 here and 3 here, and we're going to get positive 11, so the outside gives us 15. So if that's positive 15 minus 4x, that's going to give us the 11x. So I really didn't have to do any guessing checking there, but you, you might have. Okay? Those numbers were kind of small. They were pretty easy to deal with. So let's look at slip, divide, and slide if you prefer that method. Uh, it's just an alternative way to do this problem. We're still going to get to the same conclusion. So if we slip, then we multiply. So we've got x squared plus 11x minus 60. Then my question is, okay, factors of 60 that add to give me 11. Well, that would be 15 and 4. I figured that out a little bit quicker than I did the other one. The first sign is positive, so that means the bigger number, 15, gets the positive sign. Now we've got to divide. We divide by that original leading coefficient of 10. Now, yesterday when we did this method, either it divided evenly or it didn't reduce. Both of these fractions reduce. For the first one, 15 and 10 are both divisible by 5. So that reduces to 3 over 2. Now, you can do that in your calculator. You type in 15 over 10, turn it into a fraction, it gives you the reduced value. I'm just doing it by hand. 4 over 10, both of those are divisible by 2. So when you divide both of them by 2, you get 2 over 5. So in this case, we have to slide both of them to get the 2x plus 3 and the 5x minus 2. So exact same conclusion. There's two different ways of, of going about that problem there. Okay. So when the numbers are small, it's not too bad. Uh, but then sometimes those numbers get a little bit bigger and we've got to do a little bit more work. Okay. So Let's work on factoring with a composite leading coefficient, 20 through 24. Okay, number 25. Speaking of GCFs, we should always look for a GCF first. Obviously, these numbers are pretty large, so that should be a good tip off that we have a GCF. By inspection, they're all divisible by 3. Uh, so let's start with that. Um, as far as our GCF. Let's see here, 303, divided by 3, and 66, divided by 3. So let's pull out the GCF of 3, so we get 9b squared plus 101b plus 22. After I pull out the GCF of 3, I want to make a quick inspection of my numbers and check and make sure that they don't have anything else in common. Uh, because sometimes, and, and the reason why I'm thinking this is because 3 is not a very big number in comparison to 27, so I just want to make sure I didn't leave anything out. Uh, and after you factor out that 3, you can look and see if you can factor anything else out. If you can, it means you didn't get the greatest common factor. You got a common factor, but not the greatest common factor. But 9, 101, and 22, I don't believe have anything else in common. 22 is the easiest number to check because I think it's only factored with 2 and 11. So all of the other numbers are not even, and 9 is not divisible by 11. So we're good. We wanted to mention that idea. Uh, let's see here. So, hmm, 9, we've got 3 and 3, but I'm thinking since this middle number is 101, it might be more likely that it's 9 and 1. So that's what I'm going to try first. And then 22, as I mentioned before, all we've got is 22 and 11. If we multiply 9 by 11, we get 99. 
plus 2, and this one's easy because the last sign's positive, so they're both the same. They're both positive, so we get 99 on the outside, and we get 2 on the inside, and those are going to add to give us 101. Okay? So don't forget, always, always, always check for a GCF first, and then factor, if possible, in the expression. So 26 through 30, they all have GCFs, and then you have to factor with a composite uh, A after that point. We're going to write a look at two special cases. One of them is the difference of perfect squares. People tend to overlook this one. They forget about it. Um, but it's, it's different from any of the other factoring that you're going to have to do. It sticks out because you only have two terms. There has to be a minus sign in between. Okay? There has to be a minus sign in between. You cannot do this problem. There's a plus sign right there, and you'll see why here in a second. And your two constants have to be perfect squares. Okay, your two constants have to be perfect squares. So the nice thing about the different perfect squares is if you recognize it, the factoring occurs the same way every single time. So 36 and 49 are perfect squares. I have a list right beside uh, the projector screen up here. Uh, but you can also, you can always generate that on your calculator. But you're, you're asking what squared is 36. Well, that's 6. And you always need to put it in the order that it is in the problem. Okay? <clears throat> We're used to the variable being the first term, but it can be the second term. The reason why you need to do it in that order is because you don't want to get the signs mixed up. Okay? You don't want to get the signs mixed up. Then the question is, what gives us 49b squared? Well, 7 squared is 49, and b squared, or excuse me, v squared is v squared. And you always have 1 plus and 1 minus. So it looks like we just made the problem bigger, but remember the purpose of factoring is to be able to solve these equations, so now we've put it in a, in a form where we can solve it. Now, here's the reason why you have to have that minus at the end. If that were positive 49 squared, that would say that both these signs are positive. And so if we were to foil this back out to check it, 6 times 6 is 36, 6 times negative 7v is negative 42v, the inside gives us positive 42v, and the last gives us minus 49v squared. Notice these two terms cancel each other. One's positive, one's negative, but they're the exact same value. They cancel. That's why we don't have the linear term in the original expression, <clears throat> but um, if that were not a minus, if that was a plus, then that would mean both these signs have to be positive, and if both of them were positive, these terms would not cancel each other out. Okay, so that's why uh, perfect, uh, the difference of perfect squares have to be the way that it does. Uh, now let's go ahead and look at an example where there's a GCF. Okay, so this looks almost like the difference of perfect squares, we've got two terms, we got a minus sign in between them. However, 162 and 8 are not perfect squares. So let's see if we can pull out a GCF and then what we're left with are perfect squares. Uh, it would be great if 162 were divisible by 8, but I do not believe that it is. So then let's check. I would check 4, but if we divide 8 by 4, that's going to give us 2, and 2 is not a perfect square. So let's just go ahead and divide it by 2. So take out 2, we get 81 r squared minus 4. 81 and 4 are perfect squares. Don't forget, and I don't think that I've really seen anybody in this class doing it, but I was just uh, looking at what first period was doing, and um, don't forget to bring that GCF down. Okay, If you pull out a GCF, that number doesn't disappear. you got to keep it coming all the way down through your problem. 9r times 9r is 81r squared, 2 times 2 is 4, 1 plus 1 minus, and that's it. Okay, so that's the first perfect, or perfect, uh, special case, perfect squares, different perfect squares. We'll look at it. 41. Now, it's no longer quadratic, but it's still a perfect square. Okay, r to the fourth is a perfect square. It's r squared times r squared. Uh, so this factors similar to the ones that we were just doing, but uh, the r squared times r squared gives you r to the fourth, 
and 5 times 5 is 25. One of them gets a plus, one of them gets a minus. It's still the difference of perfect squares. It's just it's a higher powered uh, problem. Really, I mean, I'm showing you all these different scenarios as far as factoring, but what it comes down to, guys, is if you can think about it from the perspective of, okay, what do I have to multiply by what to get the first? What do I multiply by what to get the last? And then if there's a middle term, then the outside and the inside have to cancel. So to really, you should be able to, to figure these out, um, whether or not I show you an example of it. Now, 48, you can be presented with two variables. Okay, you can be presented with two variables. And again, these are all perfect squares. 25 and 4 are perfect squares. a to the 4th is a perfect square, and b to the 4th is a perfect square. So 5a squared and 5a squared, 2b squared and 2b squared. It looks really weird, but that's what it is. Okay. What times what gives me this? What times what gives me that? So let me spell all these. So give some of these with the different variables a shot, 42 to 47, the higher powered, and then the combination of two. A perfect square trinomial has three terms, trinomial, meaning three terms. The first and the last are perfect squares. So we've got 49R squared and 100. Those are perfect squares. And the middle term is two times the numbers that are squared for the end. So 2 times 7 times 10 is what gives us 140. So the way that we factor these, same deal, the perfect squares, you break them into their square roots or however you want to look at it, what did I square to get that number? So 7R, our first two terms, 10 is our last terms, and then we look at the signs. The last one's a plus, the first one's a plus, so both of those are positive. Now, the deal with perfect square trinomials is that they always give you the exact same factor repeated. So typically, you will see it written like this, 7r plus 10 squared, because it, it is 8 times itself. Um, so this is how I want you to write it if you are um, presented with a perfect square trinomial. Okay, you got to write it with the squared because that's how you're going to see it as a multiple choice and answer choice. Okay, I guarantee that's how you're going to see it. Um, so I do insist that you write it that way uh, if you have a perfect square trinomial. Okay, uh, let me look at my... Okay, let's look at 55 as well. Okay, as it is written, this is not a perfect square trinomial because 45 and 80 are not perfect squares. But we should always look for a GCF. All those numbers are divisible by 5. So we'll start by taking out a 5. So we're left with 9x squared minus 24, 24 plus that goes once, 16. Yeah, thank you. Okay, plus 16. Now it is a perfect square trinomial. 9 is a, a perfect square, 16 is a perfect square, 24 is 2 times 3 times 4. Um, so it's going to be 3x minus 4 squared. Yes, sir? Um, it comes from the fact that if I write it like this, 3x minus 4 times 3x minus 4, when I do the outside, I get negative 12x. When I do the inside, I get negative 12x. So I have two of those. That's where the two right here is coming from. Okay, that was his question. Well, I mean, it, I'm just pointing out the fact you, you really don't have to really use that at all. I'm just pointing out the fact that that middle term is two times the first, uh, the square root of the first times the square root of the last. Um, no, I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's just a characteristic of perfect square time angles. That, that's all there is to it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it's just, it's an observation that every single time, the outside and the inside give you the exact same thing. So you have two times that product. Okay? All right.